The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. Well, Phil, we're a few days from October. Can you believe it? It's amazing. We're almost there, and it's... You know, I, I've been trying to figure out when to get the all-hailed, amazing pumpkin spice latte. Okay. You know, so... We so when, haven't gotten it yet? No, not yet. Have you yet? Oh, a couple times. So you've jumped in early. Yeah, but I get the iced ones. Oh, I see. I don't get hot. Okay, okay. so I I'm trying to ones. savor it. You know, I don't want to jump in too late, because I'll get the pumpkin spice let down, you know, the diminishing pumpkin <laughs> returns. Right. So I was thinking the first day of fall is yeah. pumpkin spice latte day. Okay, yeah, right. I'm good with that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And that's when I start watching my shows and reading my scary stuff. Yeah, yeah. But and, pop- you, and, you, and you didn't get your pumpkin spice? Not yet, no. I haven't been out of the house, really. You know, I've been... Now, you do, know, you get, you get, do you get coffee or do you get the latte? Oh, I get the coffee. You get the coffee. Ice cold coffee. coffee is a sacrilege against the coffee gods. <laughs> I just don't believe in it. I don't like it. Okay. You know, but, so, have you, but have you ever had a pumpkin spice iced latte? Not no, coffee, but latte. No, no, I have not. They're very good. They're different. Yeah. They're a bit different from the coffee. I'm a very bad fox. <laughs> but I'm T. Fox Dunham. And I'm Phil Thomas. And we are counting down to Halloween. We sure are. Can you believe it? I, it's, it's so awesome. I'm, I'm loving this time of year. I know, me too. It's finally getting a little cold out. It's been warm here in Philadelphia. And this is What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. This is a wonderful episode. I'm really excited about this one. Episode 127, 127 episodes, and I love the title. Yeah. It's Up to My Ass in Alligators, the Joe R. Lansdale story, because <laughs> we have an amazing guy on the show. Joe R. Lansdale is a celebrated author in many different genres, including Western, horror, science fiction, mystery, and suspense. In fact, you could almost say he's the Joe R. Lansdale genre. Okay, He's written comics, novels, and short stories, and several of his novels have been adapted to film and television. Known for his ironic and strange topics, Joe has won many awards, including the Mystery Writer's Edgar Award and 10 Bram Stokers. His characters, Hap and Leonard, have been made into a series for the Sundance Channel, and everyone knows his movie, Bubba Hotep, starring Ozzie Davis and Bruce Campbell. Absolutely. And Lansdale was a contributing writer for Batman the Animated Series, mm. credited with three episodes along with other animated series, and his short story, Incident on and Off a Mountain Road, was adapted for the first episode of the first season of Masters of Horror. Well, wow. Lansdale and daughter Casey have started a publishing company called Pandai Press to control the reissue and publishing of his older works. He also teaches at his own Shen Chuan Martial Arts School, Lansdale Self-Defense Systems, and he's a member of the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame. He's the father of the actress, musician, and publisher Casey Lansdale, and reporter and screenwriter Keith Lansdale. That's wonderful. It's true. Joe, fantastic to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. I had my pumpkin spice just moments ago. Oh, see? Uh He's got a pumpkin spice. You've got a pumpkin spice. I'm like... You're you're lagging behind. I'm Jones. I'm going to text Allison. You should. Get her. Tell her to bring you one. Oh, it's so late for coffee. I've got to go out tomorrow and get... Oh, I I don't want to stay up. I'll end up staying up and reading and playing video games all night. (laughs) 
but this is episode 127, Up to My Ass in Alligators, the Joe R. Lansdale story. I love that title. Yeah. It's, it's just good incredible. <laughs> I'll tell the story later about how that evolved. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Mm. And I'm excited to have him. Joe, how did this all yes. how did this all start? Did you always want to write? You know, I did. I, I, I've always said that comic books were my entry drug when I was four years old. And I started trying to write them and draw them about that time, too. And uh, I was like one of the amazing artists when I was four. And when I was six, I was still pretty much the same. By the time I was 12, and even now, I haven't improved since I was four. So my uh, precociousness didn't last long. It was just, you know, wonderful at four. But I, I did go on to write the stories. And uh, I found that that was where my real calling was and my real love was. You know, I really, really liked uh, telling stories. And then I started seeing things on TV because when I was young, they were actually trying to find things for TV because it was a relatively a new thing, at least as far as like the general public. And they were starting to try and find stories. So among those things they found were old serials of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and Tarzan movies. And then that led me to reading short stories and novels because there were, you know, there were all kinds of movies based on novels, too. And I read classics, illustrated comics. All of that led to me reading and becoming really passionate about writing prose. So I and strictly speaking, I owe it all to comic books. Mm. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of comic books myself. You know, when I was a kid, yeah. I was, and I kind of uh, kind of stopped as I got older. Did but, you? Yeah, I mean, I had some like, Incredible Hulk and Superman and things mm-hmm. like that when I was the old 70s uh, comics. What, what's interesting, though, is how you enter in through one format and end up doing another. You know, poets who become short story yeah. authors, or and you, you sort of work, and I, I know a lot of authors who become screenwriters as they get older and look yeah. for a new talent. Yeah, I, I still love comics. I still love comics. And, uh, you know, I don't read every comic, and I, um, I like some superhero comics, but comics don't just have to be that. And, and like I say, the classics illustrated were fantastic, and they're now being reprinted, but they gave you access to all of these major works of uh you know, uh, writers like Poe and mm-hmm. Dickens, etc. And so that led me to reading the originals and it gave me a real education. And without comics, I wouldn't have done it. And it also kind of gave me some idea of how to write scripts. It gave me an idea of imagery and how to make things look, uh, I don't know, special, like a painting, like a drawing, you know, or, or like, a, you know, a film still. Mm-hmm. And all of those things incorporated in music, you know, I was, Again, you know, I was not only at the birth of television, I was the birth of rock and roll, rockabilly is what we called it back then. We, when I was a little kid in about 56, that's when it hit, and I was probably five years old, and I remember listening to Hank Williams on the radio, and he'd been dead for probably, I don't know, three or four years, and hmm. then there were, you know, uh, Hank Thompson and Ernest Tubb, and then all of a sudden, there was Elvis Presley. And uh, that led me to searching as I got older into uh, finding out the roots of all these things and the black musicians on what they used to call race records and uh, certain channels that were designed primarily for black listeners. But all of us, you know, we were listening to all of that stuff. And music has a lot to do with how I write. It has to do with a, a rhythmic approach to what I put on paper. It's that's amazing. that's me too. Yeah, um, I can't really work without music. Yeah, me too. Tunes out the world. Yeah. And oh, I can work without it. I can't work with it. I <laughs> listen to music all the time, but if I try to write when I'm uh, listening to music, no, that, that doesn't work for me at all. I listen to it at other times, and it certainly influenced me. But I can't listen when I write because I become more <laughs> sort of patting my foot or singing along with it or you know whatever. That so I have to have complete silence. But I'm. I'm easy. You get the phone ring. I can come in, somebody and talk. I can go right back to doing it. But I still have to have my space there. And music, to me, interrupts that space. When I get through, then I can listen to music. You know, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I listen to music, but I don't listen to music with lyrics. Really? No. So you not, like that? Right. Because I, 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 I'm listening to the words. You're hearing and, the words, and, and it's I jumping. can't do it. So what I do is I put on like kind of like synth music. Yeah. With with no lyrics, just something in the background, just kind of there. You uh-huh. know. Almost like an air conditioning just blowing, you know? Um, white noise. Yeah, white I, noise. I, I, I can't do that either, man. I can't do white <laughs> noise. And wow. uh, to me, you know, a synthesizer music is like being, you know, held down and having a nail drip through my balls. <laughs> okay. I just, I'm not interested in that. That's the little blurb at the end I'm putting in. I always stick a little bit of dialogue and stick that. it at the end. That's definitely That's through his balls. <laughs> Joe's Lansdale's balls on what are you afraid of? Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Well, that nail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, what were your early successes and failures like? Well, I had mostly failures. I started out wanting to be a writer, but I, I never wrote a piece to try to place it until I was 21. And the first thing I wrote was a nonfiction piece, and I sold it first crack out of the box, wrote it with my mother. And uh, then I wrote several others after that, and every one of them sold. I, in fact, my wife and I got married when we were 21, and I started selling immediately, and I sold everything I wrote that was all nonfiction up until I started trying to write fiction. And then I was working in the rose fields, uh, you know, which is not an easy job, and we had a really bad winter. And uh, my wife said, well, look, I'm, I'm working in this at this place that puts meat in these freezer trucks. And it was called, you know, uh, I think it was called Southwest or something like that. But anyway, she had to wear like a, a snowsuit <laughs> and then she would put this lunch meat in there. And she said, look, the weather's so bad for right now. You're not getting a lot of field work. Take three months off and just try to write fiction. But when I come home every day, you better have something. So I wrote a story a day for 90 days, 90 stories, one finished every day, some longer than others. And uh, they were all just awful. But I, I got a lot of shit out of my system and I started mailing them out. And over a four year period, I got a thousand rejects because you could send things to yeah. 10, 15 yeah. markets back then. And so I could have all those stories out and then. You know, I, I had uh, multiple markets, but if they had to have time to process because you didn't do them with the email, you did them with books. I mean, excuse me, with mail and yeah. you would send them out and wait. And so over that four year period during a time during that period, too, I was also writing other stuff and had begun to sell. But I think those 90 stories were like my the best part of my schooling as a writer, besides reading, which is more important than than writing, actually, at first. Um, that's, that's what helped me. That's how I learned to get things done. And as far as like rejections, I never had any trouble dealing with them. I didn't like them, but they just made me mad and made me <laughs> want to write hmm. more. And so I did. And then one day I looked up and I, you know, I'm I, my wife says, you should go full time now. And so I went full time and I've been full time since 81, since I was 29 years old and I'm 68 in October. No. Wow. Well, you know, it's it's exactly like that. I started back when you're when we were mailing out stories, and it would take a couple mm -hmm. of hours to put together one submission. Back when you had to print it out, you had to make sure it was perfect, the right cover letter, the right paper. You know, pristine. You had to have right. S A S E right. in the thing, and it would take a lot longer because they would have to go. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you had all, when I started out, we were using typewriters, and I had a manual, the first one, mm. which you had carbons, and they slipped, and you had, and then when later on, when they had the Xerox machine, that was like wonderful, you could Xerox, but <laughs> there was an obvious difference between the typewritten manuscript and the Xerox at that time, so you had to send out the typewritten, and the Xerox was only there for you to rewrite it if they lost it, or set their coffee cups on it, which they were prone to do, huh. you'd get it back with a coffee cup circle on it. <laughs> and so then eventually when, when it got to where the, the machines could copy in such a way you couldn't tell, you know, which was the original, which wasn't, and then moving into computers, that became easier. But people don't realize just the, and you know, not only you're putting it all together, you're driving, and we lived out in the country, so we have to drive into the city to mail them. It was just, uh, you know, a nightmare. Right. We didn't yeah. know it was a nightmare then. It was the only thing we knew how to do. Right. Right. It's it's so much easier, but it, it also leaves so much room for um, laxadiacal behavior, yeah. for, for lazy professional submissions, and it really ups the submission level because people who are less serious about the art yeah. submit, you take you got, you a, got a big so point there. You've got a, you've got a problem there, too. That's, that's true, but I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit. I think that when the computer came along... I became a better better writer mm -hmm. because I was afraid of that and I would and I could just change things without having you see you'd have to retype a page ten times. So your mind might go, Well, do I really need to change that? Right. But with the computer I know I can change this instantly and make this more what I want and I can do my work quicker because I can make corrections without white eye white out all over the place. I mean I look like a Dalmatian at the end of every day. <laughs> you know, I had that stuff all over me. Wow. And uh, so to me, I, I think the computers have actually made it better for me, and I think I do better work because of computers. Yeah, I couldn't work without a computer. I learned on a computer, right. and I learned how to turn the words on the screen into liquid mm -hmm. and sort of yeah. moving it around like water, right. you know. Um, and I, I don't. I tr I've done a few typewritten stories, 
and they drive me crazy. Really? Because I can't change the mm-hmm. words in my mind on the screen. And it's like I said, it, it turned your story into soft play. Right. Well, we are talking to Joe Lansdale on episode 127, Up to My Ass and Alligators, the Joe R. Lansdale story. This is episode 127, and we are counting down to Halloween. We sure are. Halloween 2019. This is our fourth season as we've been going. We started this as a sort of four-part miniseries, and then yeah. it was very successful, so we kept going. Yeah. Whereas back then, we thought 100 downloads a month were a little odd. <laughs> you know, it's really... We're almost up to 200,000 now on Pararex Radio on Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for every episode, a page on every episode, our archive of ghost stories, fiction, articles, and a lot of fun stuff. Okay, I'm working on it. But we're going to be right back with you. I'm going to play a little ghost story. And this was sent in. This is called The Lady in White Haunting the Mountain View Cemetery. It's a true ghost story that was submitted by listener Sean Jameson. It's set on Coltis Lake in Vancouver, and our wonderful English David Walton reads it on What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? Hi, I'm Tim Wagner, Bram Stoker Award-winning author. Hashtag Grave Girls. This is Katrina Weidman of Destination America's Paranormal Lockdown. This is Jim Chambers. I'm the author of The Engines of Sacrifice. This is Jasper Barr, award-winning author of The Final Cut. And you're listening to What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? To What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? Love it. Fan, fan toxic, please. Fan toxic. Explore the darkness. Find out what goes bump in the night. (gasps) Did you hear that? Did you see that? What's that bright light in the sky? (gasps) Oh, we so need to investigate. Calling all witches and sensitives. Explore Explore the the paranormal. paranormal. With host Shauna and Vicky from From Geeks Geeks Paranormal. Paranormal. Wednesdays at 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Let's Let's explore. explore. On paraxradio.com. The Lady in White Haunting the Mountain View Cemetery. A true ghost story submitted by Sean Jameson of Cultus Lake, Vancouver. Read by David Walton. One summer night back in 1987. My brother, two friends and I drove an hour and a half east of our homes in the suburbs of Vancouver. Our destination was a place called Cultus Lake. We were in high school still, and on any given weekend, kids would head to the lake to party and camp out. We didn't know of any particular parties that weekend, but we rolled the dice and headed out anyways. We got a late start as some of us had to finish shifts at our part-time jobs, so by the time we arrived it was already dark, which in the summer happens very late in this part of the world, probably about midnight. For a long time we scoured the campsites, but to no avail. We weren't going to find any particular faces this night, so we decided to settle in and find our own site anyways. We built a fire and sat at a picnic table for a few hours talking, while some weather moved in and it started to rain. It was now very late, maybe 3am. Defeated, we decided to end our adventure and head home. It was another hour and a half back to the city, but we were young and unfazed by the time, so home we went. As we entered the outskirts of Vancouver, we passed by Mountain View Cemetery, where my grandparents happened to be buried. My brother and I lobbied that we should drive in and find their graves. Our friends agreed, so we pulled into one of the driveways, which at that time remained open throughout the night. It's a very large cemetery, 106 acres in fact. Our search was made more difficult because it was still almost completely dark. Dawn was just starting to lighten the sky from black to purple, but that amount of light wasn't very helpful in reading tombstones. It was, however, enough light for one to see from one side of the cemetery to the other. The driver, who is now a police constable, was far more reckless in his youth wild-eyed and slightly ADD. 
he decided to take his first turn in the graveyard off-road. He cut the corner on the cement driveway and dropped onto the grass for a few yards before bumping back onto the pavement. We all protested and reminded him to be more respectful and I hoped that he hadn't driven over anyone's resting place. Now, this cemetery is huge, but there are very few obstructions to your view. Most of the headstones are flat in this section, and there is only the chapel and crematorium on the high ground near where we entered. We drove around aimlessly for about 20 minutes trying to find the Musicians' Union section, where our relatives were. It was enough time for the sky to give its first hint of dark blue to the east. We stopped the car and got out to survey the spot where we thought they were buried. Now we could make out the writing and realise that we were still in the wrong spot. Not only the wrong spot, but the graves we were standing near were unkempt and had sunken several inches below ground level. As this began to creep me out, I noticed movement at two o'clock, maybe a hundred yards away. Glinting brightly, I saw what looked like a woman running down the pavement in our direction. I froze for a second and did a double take, before alerting my brother and our friends. She was even dressed like a ghost. She was dressed in all white, wearing something like a nightgown, which flowed behind her as she ran. She also had no shoes on her feet. We all stood in disbelief for several seconds as she came close enough that we could hear her crying. It was like a horror movie wrapped in a comedy as we clogged the entrances to the car, each trying to push the other out of the way to find safety first. We squealed out of there like a race car and didn't look back. Decades have passed and there have only been a couple of occasions when we all got together again but I made sure to bring up the incident, just to make sure that my memories hadn't been tainted or misrepresented. And no, there was a consensus. We all remember that night pretty much the same way, and we're all pretty sure we saw a ghost in the graveyard. going i'm going back to the paranormal view back where i belong please please take me with you no i'm through with everything here i want to see if there's something left in life i haven't explored do you know what i'm talking about oh red red don't run to them they talk about ghosts and hauntings ufos and all kind of supernatural scary stuff you'll never understand will you scarlet no well that's your misfortune Go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear. Line! Oh, you, you gotta be line. kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. Once a year, we celebrate the dark, glorify the shadows, and summon the monsters to walk with us in the daylight. Once a year... We wear our darkness in normal society. What are you afraid of? Ghost stories, interviews, horror fiction, music and comedy sketches, plus witty banter with horror authors T. Fox Dunham and filmmaker Arthur Phil Thomas. We're counting down to Halloween 2019 with extra episodes of the show plus two specials. Phil and Fox will be at the Hotel Marquis de Lafayette in Cape May, New Jersey on Friday, October 25th in the evening to listen to your ghost stories and record our fourth Halloween special. Halloween at the beach. What are you afraid, what are you afraid of? Four years of horror with over 130 episodes, 200,000 international downloads, and named number 12 in Feedspot's top 30 horror podcasts. So celebrate your darkness this Halloween 2019 with Fox and Phil on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show on Para-X Radio on Friday nights at 9 p.m. and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com Come and get some candy, kitties! 
we're back. Uh, thank you for being with us with Joe Lansdale. Uh, what are you afraid of our paranormal show? Up to my ass and alligators. <laughs> the Joe are... I'm going to keep saying that. Yeah, well, I, think, I think we both should say that. You know, because cause I had contacted Joe, and he wrote me back, which was the first surprise, and he said, well, I don't really believe in ghost stories, so it's not a fit. No, Joe, we do horror. We do everything. We do everything. Please, come on. <laughs> Jump back in. I've had to do that a few times. Yeah. Save, save interviews and right. things like that. And we were trying to work out a day to get him on the show, and his obviously Joe does an incredible amount of things. He's out there living the dream. And he wasn't sure of his schedule, and he was going back and, okay, Wednesday night. No, no, Tuesday night is good. No, no, wait, Wednesday night. <laughs> and I yeah. said, don't worry about it. And he said, um, just in the single email, up to my ass in alligators. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I didn't know how to read that. I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> well, that's kind of uh, an old Texas slang for being so busy. It's like I'm fighting a bunch of alligators, you know. I've got one thing here and one thing there. And uh, that's the way I feel. But, you know, you did say something that I think is absolutely accurate, at least in my case and how I view it, is I am living the dream. I love this. We do a lot of ghost stories. We interview paranormal investigators. We've had some wonderful people on the show. And what we also, as authors ourselves, that's why we started this, was to promote our work in a way where we weren't just bugging people's Facebooks, buy my book, buy my book. We wanted to provide something entertaining. We talk to a lot of authors and we help them with advice and talking to a very established people with wisdom and such. Could you tell us something about your writing process? Where do your ideas come from and how do you start to develop them into your amazing work? Well, for me, ideas are like a dime a dozen. I got ideas all the time. One of the things is, is for me isn't so much ideas. It's learning which ideas are meant for me. Just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it's one I should do. And that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is that if I have an idea, I don't plot it out. I don't figure I just say, oh, that's an interesting idea. And my mind will find an opening almost immediately if it's really driving me. And usually I have one that I'm working on at that time. So my subconscious works on these things. It must do all of that. But for me, I'm not conscious of it. And then I just start writing. And the next day I get up and I take up where I left off. And, and so it's always just there for me. That doesn't mean it's not, you know, hard from time to time, but it does mean I don't I don't feel like I have to work to find ideas. I have to work to throw ideas out. Because if you have too many ideas, and most of mine generate from my own life uh or from my own experiences uh or from my reading and things like that, but you you know, if ideas shouldn't have the stink of the library on them all the time. As much as I love reading and as much as I am an avid reader, I think you've also, you know, you got to get outside your house. You've got to get out and meet people. And I never work over three hours a day unless it's something unique. I get up in the morning, I do that, then I have the rest of that day to live that life and to do the things I want to do, whether it's martial arts or whether it's read or whether it's watch movies or it's hang with my family. Uh, all of those different things are part of what writing's about. And to write something you know doesn't mean you had to have uh, sailed around the world on a log or climb Mount uh, you know, Everest in, uh, I don't know, roller skates or something. But it does mean that you have to have some feeling for human interaction, which more and more fiction I read, I can tell people never leave their computer because it's, it's got the, that, that stink of the library about it or that stink of the computer desk. There's no feeling, there's no, uh, you know, no emotion and uh, no f uh, real red blood in a lot of the stuff that I'm reading. And uh, so to me, you know, it's important to borrow from your own biography or autobiography because you can make it more real, even if you just take elements here and there. It doesn't feel lived in. I li oh, I like that, though. Yeah. That's very good. When, you, when you're reading something from people that just constantly not doing anything, they're not experiencing yeah. life, and they're just sitting It there. doesn't feel lived in. Right. I love that. Though. You can read fight scenes. You can tell somebody's never been in a fight. You can read sex scenes and tell a virgin. You know, you mm -hmm. can tell all of these different things in, in your stories. And so life, living life's important. And again, you don't have to live a dynamic life. I mean, I've had a fairly interesting one. I've done a few things in my life. But mainly it's just that knowing what it's like to be someone who started out poor, had nothing, had to deal with people, had to deal with uh, adversity and things like that gives you a different viewpoint. I'm not saying everybody should have to go through that or needs to, but I'm saying for me, that's what worked for me. If you, you know, if you've grown up rich and you're in a, 
a house with uh, everything that's needed and you've grown up that way, then that's your reality. And that's something you start your stories from. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get outside that from time to time. And I've done that too. But I think most of the stuff that I've written that has any worth to it somehow has a seed in my own experience. It's funny he said, too, the, the ideas that are right for him. And uh, something I've had to do yeah. as I've matured as an author was I used to think my first ideas for a short story or for an anthology I was going to submit to were the best, and I would just run with them. And now I've learned that even if it's a good idea, it may not be what I need. Mm -hmm. right. Well, yeah, it may not be for you. Yeah, I've learned, and I have a new motto in my writing. First ideas, come up with a few more for that particular thing. Mm -hmm. And then pick one that feels right. Absolutely. That's perfect. Well, yeah, not not all eclairs taste the same. They may look good, but you have to find the one that tastes right for you. There, there are ideas that I have had that I said, that idea right there, that is an incredible idea. It would make a marvelous novel, probably even a best-selling novel. But I'm not the guy to write it because that's not you know, how I think as a, as a writer. I can recognize a good story. I can recognize a good idea, but it's not for me. My friend Neil Barrett Jr., who is a who's gone now, but he was a great writer. A lot of people don't know him and should. But he and I once joked. He said the thing about wrong with you and me, uh, uh, Joe, is that we think. And he, and I laughed because I knew what he meant. I, we're not we don't write global stories. We write neighborhood stories, or we write stories with uh, you know in, in that take take place in our our uh, our part of the country or our. Uh, community, that sort of stuff. We don't tend to do things that take place on the space station, and we don't tend to do, you know, James Bond global adventures. And, and is there anything wrong with it? Of course not. There's times when I wish I could do that, but again, again, that goes back to recognizing that certain ideas may be good, but they aren't necessarily ideas that are good for you. I like that. Fantastic. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, now, you, you did touch a little bit on the industry, how it changed a bit with sending out hard copies yep. and typewriters and things like that. But um, other than what you uh, specified, how has the industry changed since you started in other areas? Well, I, I think one thing is the biggest change is that there are fewer publishers. There are fewer book publishers. There are, magazines have disappeared. It used to be such a treat to go to the you know, magazine rack and see all of these different titles. And, and even magazines like, uh, you know, home journal or something like that they carried fiction and places like playboy not only had uh, you know the fold outs and the old joke was i buy it for the articles and fiction <laughs> but the truth is you could there were ray bradbury and richard matheson and robert block and all of these great writers and and literary writers that and i think many of them are too but writers that were no more as literary writers than writers of popular fiction up in those pages. And so you were you were better read in many ways because there wasn't as much of a distinction. The worst way to be a, uh, a the easiest way rather to be a bad horror writer is to read nothing but horror, to watch nothing but horror movies because then it becomes incestuous. You need to have other interests. And if you don't, you'll burn yourself out. You'll burn out and you will lose interest in what it is you're doing because you'll begin to think that's the problem is horror. The problem is you. You've got to read other stuff. I mean, th this week, I mean, I, um, I'm reading uh, uh, to uh, A God Unknown by Steinbeck, which is absolutely wonderful and even has a fantasy element. And at the same time, I'm reading Old Classics Illustrated again, which we talked about. I'm reading short stories by Flannery O'Connor, my favorite short story writer. And I'm not saying that you should read necessarily the same things I'm reading, but what I do believe, and I honestly believe this, don't read in your genre only. Read in it, but don't read exclusively in it. And you'll be surprised at all the wonderful fiction there is out there and how you can bring those elements to your fiction. I, I don't just write horror, of course, but nonetheless, when I have, I think the best of my fiction is stuff that was uh, written with some experience from having read other kinds of material. I was just telling Allison this morning about the wonderful movie version of Being There by Jersey Kandonsky. And have, yes. Do you know Being There, Phil, the book? Yes. Chauncey yes. Gardner. I know the book. I know the yeah. book and the film. Uh, yeah. Peter Sellers. And, of course, he played these intense characters all his life. And being there was the film he wanted to make most because he could be nothing mm -hmm. in that film. Just 
It's yeah. Just such a wonderful movie. Um, I'll have, have to watch it. I think oh, I've seen it many years ago, but it's been a long time. Uh, Allison loves the book. Mm. Absolutely. My wife, Allison. So we're talking with Joe Lansdale, Joe R. Lansdale, on episode 127. This is What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. We're really happy to have him on the show. He's a legend, basically. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. he's on television, well, movies. He wrote episodes of Batman, some of my favorite episodes from the end. I was just watching those. It was Batman oh, Day. Yeah, nice. and my wife, uh, my I wrote wife, four of them, actually. I, I wrote three that were Batman the Anime series, but I wrote yeah. one for when they were like something like Batman and Robin Adventures, right. and I did a Superman. I did a uh, sort of the outline for one of them. Yeah. But now you're reading a book, Phil, called Halloween Fiend. Yes, I am. How is it? So far, it's good. You're enjoying I'm it. I'm loving it. Yeah, it looks like a, it's by C.V. Hunt, and I just spoke with C.V. Hunt Carrie, and right. she's going to come on the show. I know. It's her interest, giving her a little plug. Now the book. It's strange isn't the small, quaint town it appears to be. It's haunted every night by a creature the townsfolk refer to as Halloween. Once the sun sets each day, Halloween emerges to collect its treats, a small, live offering from each household. The residents comply because no one wants to be the target of Halloween tricks. But the nightmare of residing in strange is nothing compared to the yearly ritual Halloween demands of the citizens on all Hallows' Eve. And you can find that. Up at Amazon.com or check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And we're going to be very happy to have CB Hunt on in our I'm holiday. Excited. I'm yeah. excited to talk to her about it. It's going to be cool. Yeah, I know. I know you brought me the book yeah. and you said, I can't wait to read this. And I said, I know CB Hunt. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know Carrie. And so I was going to say, I, I'm not reading it because we have her on. I yeah. read it before we got her. You didn't even <laughs> know, I her. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, we were going to get her. And it's a good chance for us to. Um, Celebrate women in heart. Absolutely. Because we've done that. Um, we've done many times. Yes, we have. And so we'll get her on. And um, I just want to mention, plug, that we are going to be in Cape May. Yeah. yeah this is exciting. And you know who I just spoke to today? Who's Trish. Oh, P.D. Really? Kasak. Nice. Yeah, she's a, she's a good friend of mine. Yeah. And looks like she's going to get it. But do you know Trish, P.D. Kasak, Joe? Yeah, I do. You know, Trish, she's, she's incredible, and she's she is. building the next level of her career. Now, we're going to be down in... I Cape know who she is, yeah. yeah. She's one. I love Trish. Yeah, she's she's one, one of the nicest, most unassuming people. She's really nice. And yeah, I love really hearing her on the show. Yeah. But we're going to be down at the Hotel Marquis de Lafayette in Cape May on Friday, October 25th. And it's going to be an evening of ghost stories, horror fiction, music, and witty banter, like our, like our show, celebrating <laughs> Halloween 2019. We're going to set up at the hotel... Actually, comping me um, some some of the room price, which is going to be really nice, and go down and do our ghost stories in Cape May on the Jersey Shore. I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun, and Trisha's going to come down and hang out with us. So that's, that's going to be great. But this is what are you afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. Getting back to our interview with the amazing Joe Lansdale. You know, I'm going to say that again because I was moving papers. Sure. But this is what you. Well, that's what I paid you to do. I paid you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm leaving that in now. He just made it yeah. wonderful. But getting back to our yeah. interview with Joe, we talk to a lot of new authors and younger authors getting started, and they're learning from their uh -huh. mistakes. And that's what you have to do. And what mistakes do you see new authors making today that just drive you crazy? That you want to, you know, go like sick a mummy on them or something? <laughs> Well, one of the things, and it's not just today, it's one, and, you know, I think we all did it. When it was starting out is using something other than said. When uh, oh, he replied, he responded, he remarked, and people said, oh, I've got to find another word for said. No, you don't. <laughs> In fact, you need to avoid all those little uh, Tom Swifties is what we used to call them. You know, uh, he ejaculated. No, let's don't do that. And, uh, you know, you would see these these words that replace said. That's my one of my pet peeves. You know, some great writers have done it and do it. But it's to me, I'm I'm more of the Hemingway about that. Is I think that the less, uh, well, you do, not less, you just don't use it. I'm sorry, but I think Elmore Leonard was the same way. Uh, uh, George Higgins, who who wrote uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, all those. Mm. When you do that, it actually takes away James Kane. In fact, he never even says anything. You always know who's talking. He was a genius at that. And uh, the thing is, is that that distracts. The other thing that I see is uh, the sort of supportive uh, piece afterwards. He said, because he was thinking about, he said as he did this, and you can do some of that, that makes a little sense, but a lot of it is that you're, the reason you're doing that and the reason you're making up these things about how somebody said something is it's because you didn't write the scene clearly. And so you're trying to explain the scene, it's tags, uh, instead of just writing the scene to where you understand what's going on. If you have to explain it, you know, that's not it. And then the other thing is just calling somebody, 
you know, the burly man is not really a description, but then again, you don't want to have a purple prose description. So you have extremes either way. The other thing that I think a lot of young doing is they immediately panic and self-publish when they shouldn't. Because a lot of times being vetted is what makes you a better writer. Being rejected makes you a better writer. And I know the markets are different, but still, you know, nearly everything I'm seeing, I'll get some uh, self-published things will be really good. But 98% of it, let's make that 99, is terrible. <laughs> and it's terrible because no one is telling them this sucks. But they think, oh, I don't want to go through all that. I want to be published now. And so they do. And then they sell five copies and, you know, that's it because they didn't they didn't have the tools to learn. You know, we and one thing we did have, we had plenty of places where we could be bad and we could be bad and get paid for it. But we weren't as bad as some because other people were looking at it and vetting it. I mean, my early Mike Shane mystery stories. Oh, my God. You know, I think they're pretty awful. But they would have been worse had an editor not told me once. I, oh, I sent him a story. He said, look, this is pretty uh, but it doesn't quite work for me. And, and so I rewrote it and he said, it still doesn't work for me. I rewrote it again. He said, I hate this story more every time I see it. <laughs> Send me something new. And that was Sam Merwin at Mike Shane. And the next story he bought from me, I wrote something new. He bought it, but that was me. You know, I wrote that same story three times. And, and of course I'd been writing a lot of others that by the time the sun went down and I reread it, I thought, oh, my God, that, oh, my God, that sucks. And so I was learning as I went, but it was also good to have somebody there to vet you or to turn down novels that you wrote or to turn down things. And gradually, if you got better, people would say, you know, this might be better if, and then you would learn a little bit from it. But the, the thing that bothers me most are publishing too soon. Tom Swifties, like, you know, he responded, he remarked, he ejaculated, that's the, and all of that stuff, instead of just saying said, or if you have two people in the scene, once it's established, you don't have to say who's talking every time. It's obvious. You know, you remind every once in a while. And the other one is the filler, where you haven't written the scene well enough, so you, you'll say things like, you know, he, he, uh, he nodded with enthusiasm. Well, it's a scene that you're going to know well, how that person nods and you go and a lot of times you don't need to nod either so you have to pick and choose very very carefully i'm gonna write that down joe lansdell says do not write he ejaculated <laughs> there goes my yeah, erotica that's bad but that's that's how i end yeah, all my even, even well you know uh <laughs> sir arthur conan doyle used to do that he ejaculated and and i i love the sherlock holmes stuff well, bradbury was always having big exclamation marks and yeah, things like that and i love yeah. bradbury yeah. so there are people who did it and i'm not trying to say it's impossible but for me, it's not as good a writing as it could be. And that's what I learned because I started out doing that myself. So, you know, one day I started looking at why am I doing this? And, and how do you grunt? A, and so and so he grunted. Try grunting a sentence for me or try growling a sentence for me. See how that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, no, it doesn't work. My big pet peeve modifiers. Okay. The overuse of modifiers. Right. Um, we have people in our political lives who overuse modifiers, mm -hmm. and it, it drives me crazy. It yeah. just you know, they 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 think they have to express so much, mm -hmm. and you have to pick and choose modifiers. It's like every sentence you only get so much currency. Yeah, to spend in modifiers are a huge cost. I want to mention though, Monsterthology is coming out. Yes, it is too. Um, from Alan Russo. And you got a story. I do have a story. You got last placement. Congratulations, Thank Phil. You. Thank you. Tin Poor Boy. James Doerr has a story in this called Beefcake and the Vampire. Walter J. Esselman, Tom Fowler, Copper Rose, Bruce Rowe, and we got stories that David Walton recorded for us. He did yes, our we stories. Do. Yes, I did yes. one, of course, I write a lot about World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, I combine my love of history. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been researching World War II since I was 15 years old, and you build up. Uh, a setting, and of course, mine is set in a uh, prisoner of war camp. Right. Um, and of course, you have Frankenstein mm -hmm. and his monster right. chasing each other and seeking out the secrets of life. So that was a lot of fun, Stuart. We're going to be playing that on future episodes of What Are You Afraid Of? You've won many awards, including the Raymond Chandler Lifetime Award, the Edgar Award for yeah. Mystery Writers of America, and 10. Rob Stokers, <laughs> ten. Uh, well, eleven, ten. eleven. If you count the Grand Master as one, they gave they give you another little Bram Stoker house. 
with his, with the Grand Master, yeah. the same looking award. Wow. Yeah. So eleven awarded from the Guitar Writers Association. So what are you doing differently from other authors that makes you such a success? I have no idea. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I do think some of it is luck of the draw, but I also think most of it is. I, you know, I really do believe in hard work. But I, like I said, I work about three hours. But I, I, when I started out, I worked every hour I could, and I held down full time jobs and full time jobs with part time jobs. But I still showed up. I was a house dad. I took care of kids. I still managed to write. And uh, I sold several novels during that time. My wife was working for the fire department, so she would have these long shifts. Then when she would come home, you know, she could take care of the kids, and I, I could write a little bit more. But I found that I went down to five hours, and I did better. But when I went to three hours, I found my perfect time because I'm a hero every day. And I can, in three to five hours, I mean, three, excuse me, in three hours, I get three to five pages. That's my rule. Now, if I have a day where I get 10 or 15, I'm happy, right. but I have to get three to five before I quit. And there's only been maybe a few days since now in 25, 30 years where I have not gotten three to five pages, five to seven days a week, because I, I work five to seven days a week. You know, once in a while I take off for a holiday, but I often take my laptop with me yeah. because, you know, my wife and I will do whatever we want. And I'm only going to take, you know, a little time in the morning and maybe a little time before bed to write. But I've gotten it done. I wrote three novels traveling through Italy and Germany and France, et cetera, you wow. know. And I love uh, that. Yeah. so, yeah, and, and I didn't didn't used to carry my laptop with me, but I got to where I was having to travel so much to promote books. And in Italy, I, I go over there quite a bit because I, I'm I'm fairly successful there. So they send me over for tours and things of that nature. And I realized that my time would be sapped if I took all that time off. Where before, you know, I might take two weeks off a year or something. And then uh, I begin to had to, you know, learn to write as I traveled. And I've written on planes. I've written in airports. But the trick is not trying to write lots of hours for me. The trick for me is to show up, do three hours, and, you know, call in the dogs. Wonderful. I like that. That's and great. That, that's just a, that's, that's great advice. Wonderful. I like, I like how he just has 11 awards, you know. Because I, I joined the <laughs> HWA as an active oh, member uh, uh, four years ago. <laughs> I think it was. I finally just joined. And um, James Chambers over there brought me, and I love James. He's a good right. friend. And yeah. I've done a lot of events with him. And it's like, I've been to the dip banquet, you know, in his Atlanta before I got married. I flew down and, you know, hanging out with, with uh, Anthony Riviera over at Grey Matter Press. It was great to see Tony and finally meet him. But it's like, I, I guess Joe just kind of shows up and they're like, oh, damn it, just give him the award. You know, just, <laughs> here you go. Here's your, here's your raven, sir. Hardly. <laughs> Dinner, dinner's over. Everyone go home. Joe's here. <laughs> Someone keep him out of well, them. You know, what, one thing people ought to keep in mind is awards are nice recognition, but they very rarely change anything in your career. And the true. Edgar change, and I, I have the Spur, which is a Western Writers Award, which uh, used to be something that had some impact, but it doesn't really have that much, but it means something because it's your peers, yeah. and it means right. something because it's readers. And it means something because, and so that's it. It's a lot, but it doesn't mean everything. And I, you know, I don't campaign for awards. I, I, I what I'm doing is I'm a writer, and I write stories, and I try to sell them to places where they will get the best exposure, or some place where I feel like this story is unique and it will better here. But I try not to write stories for other people unless it's something I want to do. I get offers every week, three or four, to do short stories. And if it appeals to me, I go, now how can I subvert this idea? Or how can I take a very, very, very traditional idea and write a really good traditional story to give myself this, uh, you know, change? just write horror stories. I write crime stories, horror stories, fantasy stories, and all of, and I've written for mainstream, I've written for Ferrari magazine. I wrote a, a, a romance story because mm -hmm. it was a story I wanted to write. And so what I find is that by all of this variable reading and, and variety of types, types of writing, you stay fresh, you stay mm -hmm. interested, you stay excited and never compete with other writers, never worry about what anybody else is doing. If they're got 50 bestsellers or, and you've got none and you're doing your work the best you can. That's all you do. You know, I mean, one of my friends is George R.R. R. Martin. Mm -hmm. Now, George and I started out about the same time. Do I think, oh my God, this is, t I think it's wonderful mm -hmm. because here's a guy who's a really good writer and a really good man, a really good person and a friend 
I couldn't be happier. I don't, it, it would be foolish to measure against giant bestsellers and what you're doing because it has nothing to do with quality. I think I'm doing good work too, but I'm not trying to compete with somebody else's success or Stephen King or, uh, you know, whoever you want to name. The idea is that the only person you ought to be competing with, as is in martial arts, truly is yourself. I just see people that get butt hurt and get their feelings so upset and they feel depressed because somebody's doing better than them and I just do not get it. So he's talking about something that I've come to understand is no matter how well you write and no matter how good your work is, it is really a lot about being at the right place at the right time for this opportunity. It is. You know, yeah. it really is. I, I do believe that if you're good and you're dedicated, you're going to be successful. Now, now, the degree of success is where luck comes in, but there is no such thing as luck. Mm -hmm. What happens is that you've been working, and there it is, and, it, and, and you're in the, if you're in the right spot at the right time, that work has what people call luck, but you had to produce the work to have luck. Yeah. So it's not like people are going to kick your door down and come inside. I'm going to stand here and you write a story that I'm going to give you a, a you know 500,000 bucks for, so I'll just be here in the chair with some coffee. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You know, there's not that kind of luck. Be ready when the moment happens right. with yeah. your best yeah. work, with your, with your professionality. Like, yeah, there's, right, there's an old joke, and it goes, the guys, two guys, they go out on the green, they're golfing, and this one guy, he every time he hits it, he knocks a hole in one, and the other guy, he doesn't do as well. So he gets to the end of the game, and the guy that didn't do as well says to the other guy, he said, man, you're lucky. And the guy says, yeah, and you know what? The more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> That's good. That's great. Like that. Well, the one thing um, would change my career as it's growing, and I went from, I mean, I felt like my work was too easy and I wasn't growing, you know, doing the little one cent a word things. And then I started yeah. uh, pushing myself for the five or six cent a word, which I do now. Right. You know, I do pretty well there. But when I was uh, dying of cancer, and you know, I really wasn't supposed to survive that month when I had the radiation, right. um, something that I looked back upon was not where I failed. It's where I didn't try. Okay. That's what haunted yeah. me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're going to fail. I mean, that's yeah. what other people think of. God, man, you've been so successful. I said, you know what? You need to sit down here. Let me tell you about all my failures mm -hmm. because the failures are what you learn from and the failures are, but the more, but the kind of successes that you can have from staying at it eclipse that. And those, those don't mean much later. And it doesn't mean you're not going to have continued, but you don't have them like you had when you first started as far as rejections go. But there are things that are disappointments in your life, like writing a book that you think is going to do well. And it doesn't. Right. Writing a book that yeah. you think, well, you know, I did my best on that, but it's not my best book. And then it goes through the roof. Mm, so right. you, the main thing is showing up, doing the best you can every time out, realizing that you're doing the best you can at that moment in time. And the next day or the day before that, you might have done better work. And it's just because everything was right. All your ducks was in the were in the row. Your underwear fit just right. <laughs> All that stuff. But most of the time, too, is that the, another big fault is people who believe in inspiration. And they say, I'm going to sit down and write, but only when I'm inspired. Well, that means you won't write a lot. And if you're like, like me, I'm inspired every day. I'm excited every day when I get up. And the more you do it, the more you are inspired. Because inspiration is you. It's not coming from by its source. It's not like all the magic comes. And a lot of times, if you'll look at the days when you really feel inspired and look at what you wrote and look at days when you don't feel inspired, they'll be about the same. You get better through experience, but you're not really, you're feeling better about it that day, but it doesn't mean it's better. The work, working as a bard, um, you know, as a young, I followed the myth of inspiration. Oh, when inspiration strikes. And of course, I loved playing the role for everybody. Oh, you're an author. Wow. What inspires you? When do you write? Oh, the spirit moves me like a Quaker. And I run to the typewriter and throw right. out 500 words like Hemingway. Right. But And then I realized that I could bring inspiration on tap. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you do it too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah when you're working on your yeah. movies. Well, you yeah. know, you, you mentioned Hemingway. And he didn't do it that way. He did the 500 words, yeah. but he did it every day. And he he didn't drink when he was doing that because he had a problem with the drink. But he didn't drink when he wrote. And he wrote every day. And he standing. didn't wait for inspiration. Yeah, standing. He stood up. Yeah, he had like put it up, typewriter up high and tight. But he wrote every day. And it wasn't because he was waiting for inspiration. That's why he was, he got better. He was successful. And he changed the way people write in the 20th century and owned. Did either one of you ever hear about the... Drink when you write, edit when you're sober challenge. 
No. You never heard of that? Oh, Phil. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not doing it, personally. <laughs> I know writers that have been doing it. It's actually, it's an actual challenge where you get drunk and you write and the next, the next morning you edit when you're sober. Edit what you wrote the night before when you were drunk. No. Sober. I don't, pain, I've never done it, but I'm just saying it's, pain I've heard com- about yeah, it. Pain compels me to write. I know. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. The happier yeah. I've been since I married Allison and stuff, I actually find it harder mm. to find the energy to write. Oh, because of, happiness is the end. I'm just the other way around. Yeah. I'm just the other way around. When I got married, that's when everything focused for me. Mm-hmm. I was all over the place and wait for inspiration. But when I got my wife, she put me on the right path. We've been married 46 years now. And for me, it was just the opposite. That's what did it for me is being happy is actually better than not being happy, I believe. I don't mm-hmm. find myself inspired uh, as well or being able to inspire in the manner in which I mentioned earlier about, you know, you know, it's coming from you. It's not coming from some secret place. And for me, though, when I'm worrying about bills, I was worrying about, you know, am I going to you know have something to eat tomorrow? Am I going to be able to pay the rent? All that sort of stuff that that that's not the sort of thing that makes you feel really good. It's an experience that you can write about later, but it's not necessarily an experience I want to deal with on a daily basis to, uh, you know, get my work done. And so to me, my best work when I have some sort of uh, feeling of security and I can fall back on those experiences when I didn't have that security, but hell, I don't want that. And uh, to me, being happy makes me write better. Yeah. I'm learning to make the transition now. It's something I've identified and I'm learning how to draw from the different places, not inspiration, but from the different emotions where I was writing. Right. I, was, I was really writing from my death because no one expected me to live right. past 40. So I was writing the books that I thought would live on after I died, my, my last sort of words. Right. And now that I'm not writing from that, I have to change mm-hmm. my whole uh, raison d'etre. Yeah. And I've been working on that and changing my whole style and sort of why I sort of dropped out and done a, a few less, you know, less novels. Mm-hmm. Right. Lately. But we are talking to Joe R. Lansdale on What Are You Afraid of Power and Paranormal Show on Para X right. Friday nights at 9 p.m. Check us out there and check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for pages on every episode, all our ghost stories, interviews, and pictures, and all sorts of wonderful information. Now, we're going to play a story that Joe sent us. This is called Shrinkage. It was in the Full Bleed anthology edited by Dirk Wood. And this is Shrinkage on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. We'll be right back. On October 25th, 2019, What Are You Afraid of? will be performing the show at the Hotel Marquis de Lafayette in Cape May, New Jersey. Join the host that evening before they form to tell them all about your supernatural experiences. For more information, visit our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. For reservations and event information, contact the hotel at their website, marquiscapemaynewjersey.com, or call at 609-884-3500, and come out and see us this Halloween 2019 in Cape May, New Jersey. Listen for the episode on Parex Radio at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on October 26th, or find it at our website, www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. Para X. Shrinkage, a short story written by Joe R. Lansdale, narrated by T. Fox Dunham. Stopping the news today. One morning, while shaving and listening to the news on TV, Jim put his razor down and walked into the living room, wiping the shaving cream off of his face. He wanted to be able to look at the screen and not just hear the news, because he was certain he had misunderstood something. He watched as aerial photographs showed the Earth as seen from space, listened to the announcer who said, The Earth is actually shrinking. Scientists are alarmed. There was much more, but that was enough for Jim to decide to change channels. Surely it was a joke. No. The other news channels were talking about the same thing. The Earth was indeed shrinking, and it was happening rapidly. Jim sat on the couch. He didn't even bother to phone into work. There were riots going on all over the world, a smaller world. Asia had shrunk, Africa had shrunk, and the ocean was now a much narrower mass of water than before. The continents and islands were pushing closer and closer together. The satellite cameras were revealing that in real time. Dang it, Jim said. 
He had finally had a date with that hot lady that worked at the coffee shop, and now he was certain that was all. No one could think about anything but how small the Earth was becoming. He sat and watched, and the ball of the Earth as viewed from space grew smaller and smaller. Chinese and Africans and Europeans were now all on the same piece of land, and fights were breaking out. Wars! All of it was short-lived, because the continents kept shrinking, and pretty soon the ocean was a salty river dividing the North American continent from Africa and Europe. In fact, down at the bottom of the world, Africa and South America were touching. Pacific Islands were in a view off the California coast. LA and San Francisco were five miles apart and closing. By that afternoon, New York City and Austin, Texas were within 10 miles of each other, and Chicago had wrinkled up and been overwhelmed by a part of the landmass that had watered up. No explanation. Honolulu was just outside of Lufkin, Texas, though it was now very small. There was no beach. The scientists who remained alive had no explanation. Preachers claimed it was God's vengeance because he was always mad about something. But no matter what the cause, the world was growing small. It defied common sense. It defied science. It defied religion. Antarctica was just down the block with a few surviving polar bears and penguins wandering about. And then Jim saw people moving towards his house. There was no longer a TV station to watch, and there was no one to report by radio. But he could see people of all nationalities moving in on his property. There were yells and gunfire. He thought he might get his gun, but that seemed pointless. Pretty soon he realized his house and his yard might be all that was left of the earth. People and animals were floating around the edges of the earth, and others were leaping up to join them. Space was close. Then they were pushing at his door, banging on the sides of his house. A bunch of folks who appeared red-faced and red-headed had their hands cupped and were pressing them against the windows where the curtains were pushed back. He got up and closed the curtains, but now the front and back doors were cracking. They were being broken down. Jim ran to his bedroom, which was in the middle of the house. He looked around. There was nothing he could think of to do. There was, in fact, nothing to do. He finally decided to crawl under the bed. Soon he heard people at his bedroom door pressing and then the door was knocked flat off its hinges and people rushed in. Lots of people. Far too many people to fit in the room. They began to lodge together like a puzzle being shaped. He could see their legs and feet under the bed. Tennis shoes and dress shoes and bare feet. Men and women. Pants legs and bare legs that were black and white and brown and colors in between. Twisted up together like pretzels. And then the room began to crack. He could hear it. From where he lay, seen through the gaps between all those feet, he could see the edge of the room creep closer. He thought he saw polar bear paws. He rolled over and looked the other way. More feet and legs, and between those feet and legs he could see the wall on the other side had moved closer, and the legs began to mass together and snap. People screamed. Now there were people on the bed, fighting, and the bed collapsed in on him as the sides of the room, and all those bodies and the darkness of space slipped together to meet him with a final crunching sound and cosmic sigh. Well, Joe, it's great talking to you, says, what are you afraid of? You know, I throw out these interview requests, and I'm very professional about it. I never bug anyone. I always say in the email, if I don't hear from you, congratulations. Very cool to, to have sort of reached out to you. And, you know, I've got I get more responses depending where I'm sending it, but about two-thirds of them I never hear from. Mm -hmm. right. But it's the one-third that gets in contact, like Steve Monarch from mm -hmm. Friday the 13th, the series. Right. I had contacted the other actors from that, never heard from them. Then I went to Steve, not that he's third best or anything, right. um, and he got in contact with us and we had a great, we had a great, great, great yeah. show. And people don't realize we're making the sausage here. I'm reaching out to people all the time. But we're turning the episodes of the ones that reach out to us back, and it looks like it's what we're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So, so Joe, you have made a career out of original work by sort of combining diverse elements, you know, such as Ozzy Davis, wonderful Ozzy Davis, believing he was JFK, teaming up with Bruce Campbell, who believed he was Elvis, thank you very much, and then they go and fight a mummy. Like, what creates this person? What elements, when you're writing thrill you like when you read something on a page and you go oh i love that well you know the curiosity thing about that one and there are a number of, of works like that when i wrote that it was just like a white heat and it was inspired by the fact that my my brother actually had met elvis and his wife went to high school with elvis in memphis he's 17 years older than i am 
And so he had, my brother had tried to record at Sun Records and, you know, he didn't have the success, but he, you know, he met Johnny Cash, met people like that. And and a, and a strange turn of fate, my daughter, her music producer is John Carter Cash. So, but I was doing the, um, um, yeah, this this thing I got this Elvis request. Write a story of called it was called Dead Elvis at that time. I think they may have changed the title later. Hmm. And we were supposed to write that story. So I had this little minor connection to Elvis. I'm a big fan of the music. I had seen all the lousy movies, and I thought, you know what, I, I'll write about that. Then I thought, well, you know, JFK, he was killed when I was a kid. It was a it was an incredible it had had a lot of impact on people of my generation and my age because it was kind of like the end of innocence for us at that time. And so those things kind of came together. I'd always loved mummy movies. And then I felt like from reading outside the field, I'd read a lot of literary things and the idea of death represented by other aspects in a story struck me. And I said, I'm going to make this ludicrous idea of the mummy representing old age, insecurity, disappointment, and all of that. And so I sat down and I wrote it. And when I got through, I sent it off and I thought, oh my God, that's the craziest screwed up story I ever wrote. <laughs> and I, I sat around for three days and I said, I'm going to withdraw that story and apologize. And so I was writing that note and I had it on my desk and I guess I was thinking about it. And I got a mail that said, this is our favorite story in the anthology. And so that Paul Salmon, in fact, I believe was the editor, but that was, uh, you know, that's how I, I did that story. And they were really happy with it. And I was so glad that I didn't withdraw it. And I wrote it in a sort of a beat, uh, poet sort of style and a sort of, uh, you know, stream of consciousness and, you know, use these kind of vaulting metaphors and things like a real mess burrows in a, in a way. And so I, I, did that story in a way where I felt like it would be funny, where it would also be poignant, and where it would also be weird, and where it would also have elements of of horror without actually fitting neatly in any one of those boxes. And then later Don uh, filmed it, Coscarelli. Well, incredible. It's such yes. a wonderful movie. I, I love it. I, I know most people in our community go crazy for Bruce Campbell, but I just love Ozzy Davis. He's got that wonderful voice. And he, oh, yeah. I met, when I met Ozzy, it was a big thing for me because he was a, a big deal for me because I had watched movies. He was a, a, one of the first black producers, directors. He did plays. You know, he uh, was just an amazing guy with civil rights and stuff, which I was, you know, very much a part of and interested in. And when I met him, that was a big. And of course, I met Bruce there, too. Mm. And I love Bruce. I've been friends ever since. But I, I, I think he is just like a really, truly good and decent human being the president is down i'll see if he said the movie <laughs> That's so, that, i love that <laughs> the president is soon dead that's what it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. President is soon dead. <laughs> uh, if you could travel back in time to give your early self writing advice based on what you know now what would it be quit school I would write. Quit wasting your time. You know, I, I'm gl I'm glad I got an education, but my education is high school, and I got about sixty hours of college. And I love going to university, but what I love doing was was reading. And 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 so I would say, quit school, go to the library. Uh, you know, if you can afford to buy books, buy books, read and write, educate yourself. Uh, and I'm not knocking school, but I, I if I had it to do over, I would have started writing. Uh, when I was 16 or 17, because I, I had some of the chops already, but I didn't have the depth. But it, had I started then, I think I would have been, you know, even better off by the time I was in my mid 20s. You know, people like Michael Moorcock and people like they were kids when they went on their careers. I think that with me is not waste time in college anyway. High school, okay, got your high school degree. And then college, take courses because you want to. Take courses for the fact that they make teach you how to have a better life or live a better life, but forget the degree if you want to be a writer, right? We're talking to Joe Lansdale on What Do You Pray to Par and Paranormal Show on Parrix Radio on Friday nights. This is episode 127, Up to My Ass in Alligators. I don't think I'm saying that right. I need the southern accent. I, I'm right. not going to do it because I'm going to insult the man. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm a very British, uh, come from my upbringing. Up to My Ass in Alligators, the Joe R. Lansdale story. And this has been a wonderful interview. Absolutely. And it has been Amazing. so thrilling to speak to you because, you know, I, I Thank think... You. And just, we've been in some anthologies together. I'm sure you never noticed me. Fox, Fox in there. Uh, we were just in the, um, 
Oh, what was it called? Uh, a Time for Violence that came out. You have a crime Oh, okay. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I've got it. I, didn't, I, I have to admit, I, I, I recognize the name because mm-hmm. I don't know many foxes. Yeah. Oh, there you go. See? Um, and, of course, fox came from my, my totem animal. Right. I'm thinking about dropping the T. Yeah. Really? Should I drop the T? You drop the T? I think so. You're I think it's pretentious. I don't, I don't want, you know, concerning my upbringing, I don't want to be pretentious. <laughs> you know, but I think yeah, I'm... Of course. I'm thinking I'm going to drop That's the T. The, the T is for the, the fox. The fox. Wonderful. That's good. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to record that and play it every night before I go to bed, Joe Wet. <laughs> the Fox. Called the Fox. But yeah, we were in A Time for Violence, a wonderful crime anthology. And that's what I love about Joe, is that even though as far as he's come, he still remembers his roots. He still goes... Yeah, you and, got to. He still goes in all these yeah. anthologies. He still finds work. You know, I'm sure a lot of publishers come and offer him very little money, or they say, Joe, we'd love to have a story from you. We can't pay you much. We can't give you the kind of exposure. And he always has something for them, like us. Right. You know, I try to, I try to help. I mean, a lot of them are reprints, but sometimes I'll write something new, too. But most of the time, it's reprints like that. But I try to do that because you, it, those people are starting, too, in their own way. They're becoming anthologists. They're becoming editors. There are other writers that you might get some exposure before because somebody might recognize your name. That, that's what, you know, used to like Stephen King and people like that when they were in anthologies and you were in those with them way back in the 70s, 80s, whatever it was. Then people took more note of the anthology. They took more note of who was in it. And so you didn't necessarily launch somebody's career, but you may have you know, heated it up. Mine may have been heated up that way many times by being in anthologies with better known writers back in the, the earlier days. And now in my own way, and for what little I have, uh, you know, in recognition, I can perhaps fire up some somebody else to pick it up and read it and discover other people. And that's what he's doing. That's he's great. given back to what the world's given to him. And it's just so great. It's very thrilling to see that name because... We, we are very insecure at this stage in our careers, even <laughs> yeah, I understand. Even with all the success I've had, too, and fill it with your films yeah. and, and your, right. your new book that you're working on, right. which, is, which is going to be very great. I, I know it is. And uh, just seeing Joe's name on there makes you feel better. Yeah. It makes you think I made a good decision. And right. it's something, something we were talking about earlier was that um, a lot of newer authors think that if they meet or you know, get to know a very successful author that somehow it's going to make them successful too by association. And just, you know, talking to Joe Lansdale today, tomorrow we're not going to get a contract from like, you know, a major publisher. <laughs> right, right, tomorrow right. It's, we're going to be exactly doing the same thing. Right, right. It's cool and all. And yeah. it's been thrilling to talk to him and I've learned from him. And oh, also yeah. had a lot, of, a lot of my ideas validated mm-hmm. too. But tomorrow I'm still going to be at the same typewriter. Right. Well, yeah, and you know, the thing is, is when you've been doing this for a while, you begin to know that you don't know a damn thing, mm. and that all of the time that I'm always learning something new, and I'm trying to find, you know, I, I work on trying to get better. I mean, I'm, I'm in nearly, I'm 68, I'm not far off the old 70 mark, and I've still, I've been published since I was 21, and I think part of that reason is I also am always trying to learn and trying to change. There are some people that want you to write the drive-in and night they miss the horror show the rest of your life, and that's there's no gain in that. I've already done that. And I, I want to write other kinds of stories. I want to reach out and have different kinds of experiences. I didn't get into this for anybody else but me. And I wanted to be able to give up something to other people. I want to be able to make a living. But I always give this little piece of advice to writers is when you sit down to write, you write like everybody you know is dead. Don't write for anybody. Don't write for your agent. Don't write for your editor, your mom, your wife your buddy, you know, whatever it is, don't write for them. Be selfish in that moment and write exclusively for yourself Mm. and to have fun doing it. Some days you're going to do it better than others. It's just like anything else, but you do it exclusively for you. And then when you get done, you can hope somebody else likes it because the odds are if you wrote it because you were enthused, more people are more likely to write it than if you tried to sit down and figure out what everybody wants and be all things to all people because you can and boy, we try. Yeah. Boy, we really I try. try to every then, day. Yes. <laughs> and then we, we get more. Yep. And you, it's, you can't do it. Something that it's been, um, I've been in a real transition. I was writing so many stories placed in so many markets. I would see a market and go, I've got an idea for that. Or let me come up with an idea for this one. I'll target that one. And I did it so many times. And I was getting published so many times. And then one day I sat down at the computer 
and I couldn't write three words. Really? Because I burned out. Well, you know, but that, out. but but you, yeah, but what you did though is that was a learning process. When I started out, I I tried to figure out the markets. I tried to write for them, and I was managed to sell things. But I thought, you know what? I'm just doing shit just like everybody else. And then one day I said, "Who am I?" You know, and why why don't I write for the the non existent Joe Lansdale magazine? And that's what I started doing. And at first I was sending out people go, I don't know what this is. I mean, now you guys are far away from that, but when I was doing that kind of work like the pit and like by bizarre hands and tight little stitches in a dead man's back, people didn't know what to make of that stuff. They didn't know what it was. They said, I don't know, this doesn't fit like horror. Isn't it supposed to have like this kind of ending or this is supposed to happen. And I just said, I'm like Joe Lansdale magazine. Fuck you, you know, to myself. <laughs> and I just kept on. And then all of a sudden I started selling. Then all of a sudden people wanted to store more stories like what I was doing. And I'd already moved on. I'd already transitioned and moved on. And then you have people that learn from you. You have people that try to copy you, which there's no, there's no future in trying to write like somebody else, except when you first start, because that's the way you learn how things work. I have some stories that, personally like Bradbury or like somebody else. And certainly their influences still remain in my work and always will. But that's how you get there. You you got you gotta go through these experiences of writing a lot and once you get successful like you were like you were talking about, I could write a story for anybody anytime. But one day I just said, I don't want to do that. I want to write for this Joe Lansdale magazine. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a writer because I loved stories and I love telling stories and I wanted to be a storyteller. And then I wanted to be a stylist storyteller that could tell that story in such a way that it was real to people. Well, you don't always succeed. I don't give a damn who you are. If you're a professional writer, you're also someone who gives it regular exercise. So you don't have an interruption in service as far as the electric bill, what we call the light bill. Get that light bill, you know, and the water and all that, the gas, whatever it is you have, the car, the house, you have to be a professional writer. But you should be able to write something that's, you know, uh, like architecture one day and the next day a solidly built chair or table, something that you wouldn't be embarrassed to have built if you were a carpenter. And it's the same thing in writing. Sometimes you wrote a professional story as well as you could. And sometimes you wrote a story that transcended, but you don't always know what you're doing. But you do develop a level at which you don't fall below through experience. But the idea that just what you did, you looked up and said, I've got to do something different. I've got to reach out. I've got to try to challenge myself. Otherwise, you find a groove and you're like Millie Vanilli. You know, that's, that's not the same. <laughs> so, okay, so I think I've learned something today, and that's, I should write for the Joe R. Lansdale magazine. There you go. That's, I, I'm going to do that too. Right. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. That's, that's what we learned today. Yeah. We're going to be original and write for yeah, the Joe yeah. R. Lansdale magazine. But I, I, sus <laughs> I suspect that the local police are knocking on your window wondering who this weirdo is with the coffee at Barnes & Noble. You know? so we, yeah. Yeah. And, but this has been great. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Actually, it's one of the few oh, episodes you're where we really learned. Yes. I, I definitely learned a few I things. I can honestly say I've learned a lot of things. Thank you, Joe, so much for coming on. You're welcome. You're this, welcome, and thank you for having me. This has been episode 127, Up to My Ass and Alligators, the Joe R. Lansdale story on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show on Parrax Radio Friday nights. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for all of our ghost stories and everything. And don't forget, October 25th, we're going to be in Cape May right. at the Marquis de Lafayette Hotel. I'm Pete Foxton. And I'm Phil Thomas. Phil Thomas is an author and screenwriter from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His screenplays have been produced into two feature films, False Face and Always from Darkness, and are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon Prime On Demand. His screenplay, Three Tunnels, was a semi-finalist at the LA Screenplay Competition. He is a member of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors, and he currently writes for Cultured Vultures. Game Skinny and BloodyDisgusting.com. He formerly held the position of Senior Marketing Manager at Eternal Press and was a journalist for Patch, where he wrote a daily tech column covering the latest electronics and gadgets. He lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is currently working on his second novel, Worst Afterlife Ever. 
T. Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife, Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard, and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books. A television series based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox's story in the Stargate anthology Points of Origin from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Fox is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and he's had published hundreds of short stories and articles. His motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. Find out more information at www.tfoxdunham.com. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.